Well, uh, about 16 years ago, in fact, uh, very close to 16 years ago, because our daughter turns 16 this week, about 16 years ago when my wife Shannon was pregnant with our first kid, Elizabeth, she and I decided to go to Washington, D.C., just kind of one last trip before the baby arrived. We loved seeing D.C., and one of our favorite attractions while we were there was the National Zoo. Uh, if you don't know, the National Zoo is it's a part of the Smithsonian, so the good news is it's free. You can get in for free and enjoy seeing all the animals and everything it has to offer. So we had a great time at the zoo, uh, and we walked through it and saw all of the various displays and animals. And uh, what I didn't realize when we finished seeing everything we wanted to see was that instead of walking around the zoo in a circle and ending up back at the front, we had actually just walked straight through from front to back. So we weren't back where we started. Uh, now, ordinarily, this wouldn't have been a problem. You just turned around and walked straight back through. But as I mentioned before, Shannon was about six or seven months pregnant. And so the idea of walking all the way back through the zoo was a little bit daunting to her. And to top it off, we had also uh, forgotten to bring her tennis shoes. So she wasn't wearing super comfortable shoes. So uh, I, in my naivete, said, you know what? We entered the zoo uh, close to a metro stop at the front. I'm sure if we exit out the back of the zoo, there will be another metro stop nearby, and we'll just hop on it and go back to our hotel. So we left out the back of the zoo, different entrance, and turned right. And I remember immediately thinking, uh, I don't think there's going to be a metro stop nearby here because we found ourselves on a uh, very, very busy road. Cars were zipping past us at about 50 or 60 miles an hour, and we were on a narrow sidewalk right next to the street. And I looked ahead, and as far as I could see, I just saw this road going on and on, and I thought we might be in trouble. At that moment, the wise thing for me to do would have been to suggest that we turn around and go back into the zoo and just wait until she was rested enough to go back to the front. But I said, you know what? Let's press on. I'm sure if we keep going, we'll find a metro stop at some point. So uh, we started to walk, you know, a quarter mile, half mile. We get a ways down the road and she finally says, I, I just, I can't do this anymore and sits down on the sidewalk next to the road. And I thought, this is not a good way for us to get where we're going to go. So I began to panic. I, we didn't have an iPhone back then, but I did have a cell phone. So I called information. I got the number for a cab company. And I just said, hey, can you please send somebody to get us out of here? And they said, well, where are you? I said, I'm, I'm not totally sure where I am. I'm on a road behind the zoo. There's an overpass. I, don't, I, can't, I can't see a street. I don't know exactly where I am, but I said, if you drive down the road behind the zoo, you cannot miss us. We are the only people sitting on the pavement behind the zoo. All right, so we waited there for a while. Uh, they never showed up. Nobody ever came. I'm sure the cab guy was like, yeah, whatever, and just hung up the phone. So finally, how did we get out of there? Well, I turned around. I ran back into the zoo. I found an employee on a golf cart, and I just begged him to please come and rescue us and take us back to the front, and he graciously did so. We got back to the front. We got to our metro stop, and then we got back to our hotel. Now, why do I share that story? Well, what happened to us on that trip was that I needed to get to a destination. I knew vaguely where I wanted to go. I need to find the metro, I need to find my hotel. But the problem was, I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know the pathway. I didn't know really where we were on the journey, how far it was in one direction or another. And I didn't even really exactly know where we had come from. I knew we had been in the zoo. But if you had asked me to locate the zoo on a map of Washington, D.C., I couldn't have done it. So I didn't know where we'd been, I didn't know where we were, I didn't know where we wanted to go, but I had a general idea of what needed to happen. Now I share that because that can happen not only in our lives to us, that we say, I've got a, a journey, I've got a mission for my life, but I don't really know exactly how I'm gonna get there, I don't really know exactly how far I've come, I don't know exactly where I come, came from. That can happen to individuals, that can happen to churches also. That as a church, we might say, you know, we know that we've got a mission. We've got somewhere we're headed, that we're here to do. It's something about worshiping Jesus, knowing Jesus, reading the Bible, whatever it is. We've got some general direction that we want to be, but we're not sure exactly how to get there. We're not sure exactly where we are in the journey as Grace Bible Church in 2020. And maybe we don't fully understand where we've come from. 
what specifically we're supposed to be doing to get to our destination as a church, as the people of God. That's what we're going to talk about for a while this morning. Dusty mentioned earlier, we are wrapping up what was initially intended to be a two-year generosity initiative, which we called Every Knee. It has now been two years plus a pandemic. We were supposed to wrap this up back in roughly May or so, but of course, uh, we decided to wait until we could gather again together at least Partially. And what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are, and where we're headed. What is our mission as a church, and how are we specifically, as Grace Bible Church in College Station, Texas in 2020, how are we pursuing the mission of Jesus Christ today? If you've been around Grace for very long, you know that we have a mission statement. Over the 55 years that Grace Bible Church has existed, the way we have framed that mission statement has varied from time to time. We've had different slogans, different ways of saying it, but if you've been around for a few years, you know that our mission statement is this. We help people find and follow Jesus. We help people find and follow Jesus. So in other words, here's what we do. Uh, We preach the gospel. We help people find Jesus by making sure that the message is out there, and you'll hear it every time I preach, that Jesus Christ, God's only son, died on the cross for our sins in our place, and then he rose again from the dead, and everybody who believes in Jesus can have eternal life. We preach that in every context where I don't know everybody in the room. And our goal is that uh, all of us go out into our neighborhoods, our families, our workplaces, our communities, and we also share the good news so that people can first find Jesus. So that people in Bryan College Station and around Texas and around the United States and ultimately around the world can hear the good news of Jesus and come to faith. We help people find Jesus and then we help people follow Jesus. Jesus. That is, we teach the Word of God. We teach what Jesus has called us to do as believers in Jesus Christ, what it looks like to follow Him. The biblical term for a follower of Jesus is a disciple. We make disciples. So we share the gospel and we make disciples. This comes straight from the Bible and straight from the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 28, a passage you're probably familiar with. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, that is to his disciples, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. That is, I want you disciples to make more disciples, more followers of all the nations. How are you going to do that? Well, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So first of all, you're going to introduce them to who God is. You're going to introduce them to God's people. You're going to share the gospel. You're going to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and then teach them to observe, to obey, to keep all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus sends out his disciples to say, I want you to go out into the world, help people find me, and then teach people to follow me. That's the Great Commission. Throughout the rest of the New Testament, this mission is fleshed out. The New Testament writers, especially Paul, will talk about this concept of making disciples throughout his writings, especially in the book of 2 Timothy, where he says to Timothy, this young protege who is leading a church in Ephesus, he says, Timothy, here's what I want you to do. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Notice that in this, in this one verse, you've got four generations of Christians. Paul says, Timothy, I taught you some things. Now I want you to teach some other people these things. And then those people will teach other people these things. And the implication is that I am making a disciple who will make disciples, who will make disciples, who will make disciples, who will make disciples, who will make disciples until Jesus returns. And those followers of Jesus will go out into the world and they will plant their own congregations or churches or gatherings of Jesus' disciples. So what we do is we make disciples of all the nations and those disciples make disciples. They multiply churches and they make more disciples and they multiply more churches so that what we see at the end of the story in the book of Revelation is that as God's people move out from Judea into Samaria into all the ends of the earth, 
God begins to build a multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, socioeconomically diverse group of Jesus followers from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's what we see, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. John sees this. He says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is where Jesus is taking all of history, is to this moment where there's a multinational, multi-generational group of men and women worshiping at his throne. As we've studied the book of Galatians so far, you might have noticed that at the beginning of the book of Galatians, Paul is really fired up. He immediately begins and he kind of tears into this church in Galatia and he says, why have you deserted the gospel so quickly? And he's angry about it. You get that sense. He's concerned. Why is he so concerned? Well, because he knows the mission of Jesus. And he says the mission of Jesus is to build a a church of followers from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. But what was happening in Galatia? There were some teachers, false teachers coming in and saying, actually, what we really need to do is keep this group of Jesus followers close and mostly Jewish. And Paul says, no, that's not the mission. The mission is what we see Jesus calling us to. Make disciples of all the nations, Jew and Gentile, slave, free, male and female, every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Now, I share that in detail this morning. Because as you look at the Bible, you see this is the mission of of every church. Now, every church might say it a little bit differently, but to help people find and follow Jesus ought to be the mission of every church that claims the name of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, every church may say it a little differently, and every church has to think about Where do we fit in terms of how we pursue this mission, the Great Commission? How do we pursue it in light of who we are? So in light of being Grace Bible Church in College Station, Texas, in 2020, and our history, and who's sitting in the room, what are the the values and the strategies that drive how we complete this mission? So does that make sense? The mission itself is not optional. Jesus gave it to us. How we pursue that mission is going to vary from congregation to congregation. So what I want to talk about this morning is how has Grace Bible Church pursued this mission? What are the values that have driven our pursuit of the Great Commission? And how does that play into what we call the Every Knee Initiative? If you're totally unfamiliar with the Every Knee Initiative and what I'm even talking about, just hang tight for a few minutes. I'm going to get there. All right, but I want to talk about these values that have guided Grace Bible Church for 55 years. It may be, by the way, you have walked in our doors in the last four or five weeks with the opening of this building, and you're not aware Grace Bible Church has a history that goes back all the way to 1965. So this church has been around for many, many, many years. And as we have pursued the Great Commission for all of those years, these are the values or the pillars that have have guided us. There are four of them. One is this, the gospel of grace, the gospel of grace. It's the first word in the name of our church, Grace Bible Church. Hopefully every church preaches the gospel of grace, right? But we have always said that very distinctively, Our church, Grace Bible Church, we preach enthusiastically and we defend it clearly that salvation, eternal life, is a free gift of God, given by the grace of God. That is God's unearned favor toward us in Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith. That is, everyone who believes can know that you have eternal life as a very, very free gift. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn it, nothing you can think or say or be that will earn eternal life, but instead it is a free gift of God. That has been at the heart of who we are as a church. In fact, when Grace Bible Church began in 1965, it began, like a lot of churches do, as a church split. 
Uh, We were once part of another church that no longer exists that was out in Bryan, but at the root of that split was not the color of the hymnals or anything along those lines. At the root of that split was actually this issue of grace. How boldly, how clearly are we going to be a church that proclaims the free and undefiled grace of God? And so this new congregation emerges and says, we are grace. Bible church. We've also been committed to the word of God. That's the Bible in our name, that we believe strongly that when we preach and when we teach, we preach and teach from the word of God. It's not that we we, uh, think that other people's thoughts about the word of God are are wrong or inaccurate, but instead, here's what we say. If we want to find and follow Jesus, We believe that the Bible is God's preeminent revelation of who Jesus is. It is inerrant, it is authoritative. And so what we do is we say, you know, we don't understand all of it perfectly, but what we wanna do is we say, as I pursue Jesus, I believe that the spirit of God that Jesus promised us is gonna help me understand his word. And so when we come in here or when we go into our Bible studies throughout the week, we stand under this book. And through the power of the Spirit, we say, God, help me understand this so that I can know not first how I need to react to the politics or the social issues of my day. That's not where we begin. We don't look out in the world and say, what are the issues we need to react to? And then I'm going to go do something in reaction to that. Instead, we say, I'm going to begin with, who does God want me to be in Jesus Christ? How does his Spirit shape the way I think, the way I speak? And the way I act in my family and in community and on Facebook. And then from there, I move out into the world. Not to react, but to bring the grace of God in Jesus Christ where he is calling me to go. And this is why historically our our Bible studies throughout the week, they're just that. They're studies of the Bible. It's why when we preach, we preach from the Bible because we believe we want to stand under the word of God. This third pillar is one that is, is a little bit distinctive of Grace Bible Church, this idea of students and families learning about the gospel of grace, learning about the word of God together. Now, I say families somewhat loosely. If you are a grown-up who is single, you're included in this as well. I don't mean to exclude you, but, but essentially what I mean is uh, we have always been a church that has been in College Station and Bryan in a university setting. And very early on, our elders and pastors recognized the strategic impact of college students, not only here, but also around the world. That college students, especially I think at A&M, are going to be future leaders in a variety of fields all around the country and all around the world. And, And college students come into our doors. And so we say, while you're here, college students, what we want you to do is understand the gospel of grace, grow deeply in the word of God, learn what it means to find Jesus. Jesus and to follow Jesus and to help others find and follow Jesus. And then you're going to go out on mission, whether you live in Bryan after you graduate or whether you live on the other side of the globe, you are going to go out one day into wherever God takes you and share the gospel and make disciples. And so we've always seen this value in students and families worshiping together and benefiting from one another in the spiritual life. So the students benefit from the maturity and the experience and the wisdom of those who are a few steps ahead. And the families benefit often from the energy and the joy in following Jesus that the students bring. And so the two are together. And that's been at the heart of our vision as a church from the very beginning. And then fourthly, world missions. This is the, this is the beautiful deal. Remember, Jesus says, go out into all the world and make disciples. That's, that's missions. He says, start here. I want you to go everywhere and make disciples. This pairs so closely with our college ministry. And here's what I mean. Grace Bible Church, right now, we have about 100-ish full-time missionaries in various countries around the globe. Almost all of them like a huge majority of them were once college students sitting in one of our services at Grace Bible Church. 
These men and women are men and women who have come in over the last 55 years to Grace Bible Church, either heard the gospel for the first time or learned how to walk with Jesus and caught a heart for the Great Commission, and then they've gone out all over the world. Some of you may not know this. In fact, most of you probably don't. Uh, We also see a number of college students leave our doors and go out into vocational ministry. In fact, Grace Bible Church College Station sends more students up to Dallas Theological Seminary than any other church in the country because we see students come in and catch a heart for ministry and then go up and go to seminary. We see students go in and serve God in the workplace in powerful ways and then around the world in missions. So, so these are the four. Okay, so these four have defined who Grace Bible Church is and how we approach the Great Commission. They also form the foundation for what we call the Every Knee Initiative. So, so this is where I'm gonna describe for just a minute. If you weren't here, when we began the Every Knee Initiative. Let me just explain what the Every Knee Initiative was and is. Okay, it, was, it was a two-year generosity initiative where we as a church said, what is the next step for us or steps for us as Grace Bible Church seeks to fulfill the Great Commission in the years to come? Not only next year, but in five years and 10 years, where is God calling us specifically? And, and here's what we said is we wanna be a part of seeing people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation come to know Jesus. And from Isaiah 45, we were reading this this passage where God calls out and he says this, he says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back that to me, what? Every knee will bow, every tongue will bow will swear allegiance. God says, uh, all the nations, listen, here's my heart. I want you to be saved. I want you to know me. I want every knee to bow before me. You may recognize that comes back in Philippians chapter two. Paul says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. That we said as a church in the next years, we wanna continue to press forward here in Bryan College Station and around the world to see the gospel go out and to see people learn to find and follow Jesus, to make disciples who will then multiply churches. Now, our primary goal in uh, around April of 2018, when we began the Every Knee Initiative, you remember we said, we, we are praying for 100% engagement in this mission, in this vision. Remember, we said we want each one of us and all of us together experiencing the joy of generously giving all that we have and all that we are to Jesus. That is, we said, yes, this is a generosity initiative. So we talked about giving, but we also said where giving begins, remember, is with worship. The idea is we give because we say Jesus is worth it, not because the church necessarily needs this money. That's not where we begin. All right, not because God needs the money, but because we are called to be worshipers and we worship God with our bodies and with our minds and with the resources that God has given us, including our money, our homes, our cars, everything God has given us, God has given it and it belongs to him. So how can we be people that say with everything I have, I wanna be a worshiper of God that contributes to the Great Commission? Now, we had these secondary the secondary goal where we said we want to raise some funds to move forward in our mission as a church. And we kind of put those funds into three different buckets. You may remember this. There was the everyday bucket. That was funding for our ongoing ministries for two years, starting in 2018 until 2020. That bucket, it was about $12 million to to continue our our ongoing ministries. That's our staff, our facilities, even our current missions uh, budget all of that is about $6 million per year across all of our campuses. So that was the every day. The every neighbor included the Creekside facility, which is where we are now sitting this morning, as well as some seed money for Campus 4. That amount was was about $18 million was what we set it at, most of which was for this building. This was the most expensive portion of the Every Knee Initiative. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the most important part, and we'll talk about that, but it was the most expensive portion, about $18 million, $2 million for Campus 4, and about $16 million was... was, uh, 
to move toward the Creekside facility. And then the every nation concept was we want to plant churches, both domestically and internationally. We set aside about two million for that. So the total that we were initially aiming at was about 32 million. Now you may remember around June, we had a commitment Sunday where we prayed and we said, Financially, uh, where do I see myself contributing to this? And we all prayed about uh, how we would contribute financially. But we also, you remember these easels that are up here? We came up and we said, uh, I'm gonna pray for a person and a country over the next couple of years that God will reach that person and that place with the good news of Jesus. Okay, so that was the initiative it was, it was to run from about uh, June 20, or 2018 until about June 2020. So the question is then, how far have we come? Remember, we want to talk about where we've been, where we are, how far we've come, where are we right now? Here's, here's what we had. In June of 2018, we had about $22 million pledged. So we didn't quite get all of the $32 million pledged. That's okay in the sense that we said, okay, we will continue to move forward, but just at a slightly different pace, perhaps, than we had originally originally anticipated, All right? So we had about 22 million pledged. Uh, we have now, as of uh, about this week, about 19 million of that raised. Now, on first glance, you go, okay, we, we were $3 million short. Let me put this in, in a different light for you. As I mentioned, uh, we were supposed to do this, what I'm doing right now, about six months ago, maybe back in May, right as the COVID pandemic began to hit our nation, was when we were going to do our final push for every knee, right? And so we talked about it and we thought, man, right in the midst of everybody having to shut down, people worried about losing their jobs, people worried about their financial situation, we didn't feel great about coming back and going, let's talk about generosity again and money right now. So what we did is we continued to pray. And what we've seen over the last several months is, is, is you guys have continued to be generous even in the face of so many struggles so that, uh, here's what I would say. In a normal two years, Grace Bible Church would have brought in about $12 million. But by the grace of God, over the past two years, we brought in $7 million on top of that. I cannot stress, even this year, in the midst of all the craziness, how miraculous it is that God has allowed us not only to continue, just to continue ministry, right? A lot of churches have shut down in the last several months. But more than that, we have been blessed with more than we have needed to continue these initiatives. Let me show you so far where the funding has gone that, that y'all have pledged and across all our campuses have, have pledged and then given. As I mentioned, about 19 million total has been contributed. The everyday fund was about 12 million, specifically 12.4 million of that. Creekside up to this point, we have spent about 3.35 million of that. That's, of course, an ongoing project, and there will be more to come. The initial Bryan campus, kind of the initial investment in that was about 240000 The Every Nation, money that is set aside to begin training people uh, to do church planting, up to this point has been about 50000 and then we have about $3 million that is set aside in cash reserves. And that decision to kind of hold some of that aside for the moment was, was made really earlier this year as everything kind of went crazy in the world. To say we're still going to move forward, but we're going to pray and watch and see the pacing as the Lord leads. Okay, so that's kind of where we are. And I want to make the point, as I mentioned before, Creekside is a huge part of this initiative. Now, it's not the end of the story, but it's a huge part of this initiative. Let me go back for just a minute and talk about how we ended up right here, where we are in 2020 in this building. As I mentioned before, Grace Bible Church began in 1965 in Bryan, in an old building that uh, was real near to, in fact, it may be the same building where Twin City Mission is today. Um, sometime in the 70s, the church moved into College Station onto the east side of Anderson Street, which is now the College Auditorium over at Anderson. Um, in fact, the first time I came to Grace Bible Church, that's where the church was meeting. It was a building that was designed for about 500 people, and there were like a thousand trying to squeeze in there at every service. 
I remember every Sunday, uh, somebody would get up and go, if you're a college student who can stand for the next hour, would you stand at the back of the room so we can make room for those who have a harder time standing? So we would stand at the back of the room. And meanwhile, they were building, when I was a freshman, they were building that, that building across the street, which is the current Anderson facility. They finished it in 1995. And I remember they finished it. They're like, we're gonna have this great celebration and we finally have enough space for everybody. So I went over to that service. Very first Sunday, this guy, guy gets up and goes, hey, if you can stand up in the back, would you please stand up in the back? We were jammed full Sunday one. And so over the course of the next 10 years, we began to see uh, God continued to bring more college students and more families into our doors. And it wasn't because we were doing anything sneaky or amazing in terms of church growth. It was because there was a movement of the Holy Spirit on the Texas A&M campus and in this community. And it wasn't just Grace Bible Church that was bursting at the seams. Churches and student ministries all across the city were bursting at the seams. So our elders began to pray. They said, we don't think God is done with Grace Bible Church growing and multiplying. So what do we do? And one option was we sell the building on Anderson Street and we build a, a much larger building somewhere else along the, the highway or somewhere else. But, but our elders and, and pastors prayed and said, you know, we really want to maintain this presence near the A&M campus for one thing. And for another thing, what we wanna do is pursue a model of growth that allows for discipleship and leadership multiplication. And that's where the multi-campus idea came from, that we would plant a second location where there would be live teaching, where we would multiply more college ministers and high school ministers and youth ministers and children's ministers and staff who would minister to the families. And we would multiply more students who would be trained up to be leaders. And so we uh, started the Southwood campus in 2008. By about 2012, the Southwood campus was bursting at the seams. And so our elders began to pray again. And in 2015, some of y'all were with us, we launched to the Creekside campus. But when we launched Creekside, we were the only church this far south. I mean, there was nobody else south of about Barron Road. So there were no buildings for us to buy down here that would fit a church. There were very few places to rent. And so what we did was we spoke with uh, College Station ISD to ask if we could rent an elementary school. Now, it was interesting, when we first spoke with them, they said, we haven't really had churches use our facilities for about five years. We didn't have great experiences before. But we'll, make, we'll do it, we'll do it. You know, we'll go ahead and make an exception for you guys and let you guys use this building. And I remember praying when we moved into Pebble Creek, God, when we leave, I pray they would decide churches are fantastic tenants and that will pave the way for more. And over the course of time, we were meeting in Pebble Creek. In fact, there were some other churches that emerged and met in other schools around South College Station that began to grow and began to preach the gospel. So that was 2015. Let me show you just a few photos from our first few weeks. This was, I believe, our first public Sunday. That's actually Chris Thompson, you can't see very well, up at the front uh, doing our host moment, our announcement moment. We had about 300 people, and this was actually the cafeteria, or the cafetorium is what they called it over there, and we were jammed in there. Some of y'all have chair set up PTSD watching this, I realize, because we did that for a long time. This was our children's ministry. There's Zach, and you can see Whitney Creel, who is still on staff with us, and a number of our volunteers with one of the younger groups of elementary students. In fact, I think my son is one of the kids on this picture from those early days. Uh, Here's another elementary picture from the gym from those early days. Uh, This is early childhood. Early childhood was down in another hallway over there. There's Jen Chalmers doing the uh, large-ish group with, I think these are the four-year-olds at the time. Uh, Some of y'all would probably know better. And then um, I really, this picture doesn't have too much to do with what I'm talking about, but... (laughs) This is Benjamin Pinkerton. He is currently our college director. Uh, He just came back to us over the course of the summer. He was uh, our Club 56 coordinator for a couple of years while we were over uh, at the at the elementary school. And so I don't know what he's thinking about there, but it it looks important. So anyway, um, about 2016, by God's grace, we identified and were able to purchase this property. And that's a whole other story that I I don't have time to go into right now, but man, we looked for property to purchase all over the place. And this just opened up for us. 
And it really was a total God move. So this property was purchased. They began to clear it, I believe, about two years ago, 2018. This is a a photo of when they were just starting to clear the property. And you can see um, some progress, parking lots going in. This was about a year ago as they were putting up the steel framing. Some of y'all know that uh, we had a little bit of a slowdown because it rained for like six months straight every single day, right as they were about to pour the foundation. We finally got it poured This is from earlier this year. And then, of course, here we are now. This is probably from just a couple of months ago. So uh, we have gone from about 300 folks meeting in an elementary school to more than twice that many people, even in the midst of COVID, meeting here on Sunday morning to worship. Um, By the time we left uh, the elementary school, We had about, I don't know, 500, 550 adults coming every week and something like 250 children down in the children's wing. This is the most prolific church uh, that I've ever been a part of. Uh, God has been gracious in many, many, many ways. And, And I share all that not because we've always had this goal of being the largest campus or the largest church in town, but instead we are continuing to multiply. And the day is gonna come soon, very soon, when when this building will be bursting at the seams. And so, so we've already been planning ahead to say, what does God have for us next? And so about a year ago, y'all know that we purchased property as a church out in Bryan, our Bryan Midtown campus. Uh, and here's a couple of photos of that building. It was previously a, a school and a church building. So it, it does need some renovation. It's an older building, but the idea is we want to have a presence in Bryan. Um, a lot of y'all were here a few weeks ago when Carlos Zazueta, our now teaching pastor who will be leading that effort, uh, came and spoke. Um, Carlos uh, really, again, almost dropped in our lap by the hand of God. He's exactly who we were uh, looking for, just the right person to lead this. Um, And so over the course of the next couple of years, Carlos is going to begin to build a launch team and begin to put plans in place to launch the Bryan Midtown campus so we can continue to help people find and follow Jesus. Now, not just in College Station, but also in Bryan. It may be that some of you say, I want to go and be a part of that Bryan campus. I had somebody tell me that in between services. That doesn't hurt my feelings at all. In fact, that is a joy to us if you say, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to drive the 20 minutes across town so that I can help Bryan Midtown get rolling. And I know that in this town, 20 minutes is like three hours in some other city. All right, but you may say, that's where God is leading me to be a part of the next phase of what God is doing at Grace Bible Church. So that's, that's where we're headed. We, we will begin to uh, plan the launch for the Bryan campus. Over the next uh, few months, we'll be bringing you overseas initiatives for the Creekside campus, ways that you can participate in this part of the, the vision to help get churches established overseas, but also to make disciples in other nations. Um, and then domestic church planting plans are just beginning. As I said, those have moved a little slower than initially anticipated, but we have a residency program, a training program that already three people have gone through to learn about principles of church planting. So they will be ready when God shows us the place and the time that we're about to move. Um, I want to close quickly with with a few points of application, but let me say this, two things. One, if you thought, man, as soon as we get a building, the journey is done. That's not how we're thinking. This journey will continue until Jesus returns. And so all of us in this room, we're called to think beyond just South College Station. It's funny, uh, our family, we moved into a new home over the course of the summer that's much closer to where we're located in this building. And so I realized the other day that mostly I just drive back and forth along Fitch. Like that's kind of my, become my daily world. And, you know, I thought it's not necessarily bad if I I work down here and I live down here and and all of that. It's only, it only becomes sinful really if I begin to say, and this area of town is all that matters. As long as we're comfortable in this building, as long as we've got everything working, as long as I don't have to drive too far, then I'm good. But God is calling us to the next step, the next stage. The other thing I would say is this, if you came down here, thinking, man, I'm so glad I'm at Creekside because I can get away from all of those college students who take my parking places and my seats. Man, have I got bad news for you. 
We're seeing students starting to come in the door and guess what? We love it. We want it. And whether you're 25 or 95, let me, let me challenge you that not only are there ways you can invest in the lives of students to help them find and follow Jesus, but you yourself will benefit from those interactions and those relationships because that's part of who we've always been. Very quickly then as we close, what can we do? The first one is this, continue to pray. Pray that God will make disciples in our midst and help us multiply churches here and around the world. Secondly, Continue to seek growth in your own life to say, God, who do you want me to be as I read the word of God, as I study the scripture, as I pray, as I pursue discipleship, continue to grow. Join one of our Bible studies throughout the course of the week and continue to find a place to grow and to serve because the more that we represent Jesus, the more we are able then to proclaim him effectively and truthfully out in the world. Thirdly, continue to give. Although the Every Knee initiative is formally over, the call to generosity as members of the body of Christ is not. And again, we don't give because God needs the money. God owns it all anyway. We give because we need to be worshipers of him with everything that we have. Right, and so uh, I'll mention this morning, if, if you know, in the midst of all of these things going on, you go, yeah, but you're not passing a plate. Let me just quickly offer, we aren't passing a plate right now, but if you're one of those people that likes to give on Sunday morning, there are boxes on either side as you leave, you can give online as we continue to pursue the vision God has laid before us. And then lastly, consider going. Again, God may lead you to go to Brian to be a part of that. God may lead you in your stage of life to say, you know what, I'm gonna go overseas and share the gospel as a grace missionary or ambassador, maybe for a week or two, or maybe for a year or two, or maybe you're in a stage of life where you say, I wanna dedicate the rest of my life to sharing Jesus in a place where his name is not yet well known. So we pray, we grow, we give, we go. Quickly as we close, uh, we're gonna watch a short three-minute video about the Every Knee Initiative, and then I will close us out in prayer.